Hi guys, welcome back to the Nevermind Poly podcast. My name is Matt, I'm your host, and we chat to rock and metal bands from around the world. How are you doing? How are you living? I hope you're doing well. Whatever you're listening to the podcast, we appreciate you for checking out the show. My guest this time around is the excellent Moose of the band Kill the Lights. Um, Moose is an absolute legend. Um, Moose is a gentleman whose career I followed for a very, very long time, all the way back when he was in Bullet for Valentine, all the way through into Kill the Lights that he's in now. Absolutely fantastic gentleman. This was a lovely conversation, and I'm really, really grateful to be given the opportunity. They have a brand new record out. It is called Death Melodies. It is out everywhere now. I highly recommend you check it out. If you're a fan of riffs, if you're a fan of metal, if you're a fan of just kind of really good banter, then listen to this podcast first and foremost. But the record is is fantastic i want to say a massive shout out to Kristen for giving us the opportunity to sit down with moose and for just generally be giving us the opportunity uh, to do this stuff it's really really uh, awesome and um yeah thank you guys so much for the support over the last few weeks and months it's been genuinely amazing and um we have recently just launched a brand new uh, YouTube channel. It's called Nevermind Matt. It is nothing related to music. Uh, you've probably seen me plastering over my Instagram. Um, it's basically me and Rebecca, obviously my wife-to-be, just going out and doing stuff, vlog-type content. So if you want to go uh, check that out, you can. If not, uh, just listen to the podcast. We appreciate you. And um, yeah, I'm going to shut up and let you guys listen to my conversation with the excellent Moose of Kill the Lights on the Nevermind Poly podcast. Let's get to it. FYI, I was pretty nervous doing this podcast. So if I do fuck up the beginning of this like intro, then yeah, I apologize. See you in a bit. Hi guys, welcome back to the Nevermind Poly Podcast. My name is Matt. I'm your host, and today we are chatting to a gentleman whose career I have followed for a very long time, is a man whose drumming has been influential uh, on a lot of different albums, which I love. I'm chatting to the legend, that is Mr. Michael Moose Thomas, formerly known as, better known as Moose, of Moose, Old Moose, bloody hell, of Kill the Lights. How are you doing, sir? I'm going to shut the fuck up and let you talk. How are you? I'm good, man. What an intro. Thank you very much. I'm quite flattered. No, it's, it's all good. It's all good. And I would normally say I've completed the trifecta of having three, but I've had more than three. So you're part of the Welsh like kind of contingent of this podcast. So I've spoken to Skindred, been all for oh, a yeah. friend, and the Blackout. So you're ne- you're now like you've made like the square Illuminati of the uh, of the Welsh based band. So um, how's things? How are you? How are you doing? Everything all okay? Yeah, all good. Yeah, just doing um lots of press for uh, the new album, and you the it's nice to hear. Um, a British accent because all I've been doing is an American. Oh, bless you. <laughs> bless you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, as we have this conversation, the uh, second album by Kill the Lights, Death Melodies, will be out in nine days' time. That is incredibly exciting for fans. From I've been sent the record today. I've listened to it a couple of times. I've tried to get a bit of a, a grapple on it. It's fucking great, just throwing out there. Just on an initial kind of couple of listings, it's got full of riffs, it's full of great bangers and things. How are you personally? How's the band feeling about the record as head of its release? Um, yeah, really just worn it out because we've been sat on it for... I tracked Drums to Death Melody two years ago. So and sure. obviously we had the demos before that because of COVID and stuff. So we're just like, ah, you know, we we just really want it out and hope people enjoy it but it's you know still scary at the same time because we're like we know we think it's good but then once it's out there to the world it's like will other people think it's good but the reaction so far has been to the singles anyway it's been quite positive that that's the thing i've i've never been in a band mate i've never been anything like that but what i will say is we're having this conversation now and luckily this conversation will go out obviously as soon as the record drops but sometimes in the world of podcast things like that I can do a podcast and it won't come out for two or three months because again, I'll get sent a promo and things and that's kind of how the thing works. And again, it's kind of sitting on like a great conversation and then like you release it into the world and everyone's like, then you get the instant feedback of, yay, this is great. Or Matt, give up doing podcasting. You're fucking shit at it, whatever it may be. And then it's kind of like, that's kind of that nice feeling. And then you kind of go, 
oh yeah, I forgot that kind of happened. Not that you'd forget an album's coming out, but do you know what I mean? It's kind of, you're you're so far removed from it at that point because it's been two years of, of the process and things. Is it kind of um, a frustration, I guess, in terms of the waiting game when it comes to being in a band? Um, I'm quite used to it now. Obviously, the record <laughs> industry, you know, there's never really a set date for anything. Everything moves all the time. I mean, I think the original date for Death Melodies was... Uh, Friday the thirteenth, which would have been that's very ominous as well. <laughs> yeah, no, we were quite quite upset that we didn't get managed to no, get that. Of course, that <laughs> would have been perfect. But, yeah, but obviously, if things got pushed back, and yeah, it's, it's just it, it doesn't get boring. It's just we get bored. Mm. We, you know, we've been sat on it for so long. We've we've already started writing the third album. For sure. But, yeah, so it's just we just want to get it out and start touring. Absolutely. And so this record comes off the back of The Sinner, which came out in 2020. It's such a weird, and I don't want to dwell too much on the pandemic and everything else, but I feel like you are a band who kind of felt a little bit un unfairly because of the pandemic. Because the record came out in 2020, then you were kind of obviously demoing things and doing like writing this record, and because of knockbacks, pushbacks, things like that. It is just a case of like, it's one of those things. So I guess kind of Kill the Lights 2024. This is kind of where we brace for impact. Am I am I kind of in the broke ball park with that? Is that kind of the game plan? Yeah, we were quite upset, you know, um releasing an album in the in the worst <laughs> Yeah, the worst of course. Time you can ever release an album. But you know, everyone was asking for it. We'd signed the record deal, so you know, we just released it and then we thought, you know, it won't last that long. We'll be we'll be touring <laughs> it now, you know. And then yeah. it's the doors didn't open. And then yeah, lockdown after lockdown, and then tours that were gonna go out in 2020 got put back to 21, 22. So this massive queue of touring mm -hmm. bands. So we we a brand new band. We were ne never gonna get a, a chance. So we just thought use this time off and just start writing. So yeah, but we just got it. We did feel like the Sinner was such a great album and just kind of got lost because we couldn't push it the way we should have, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a, a few bands, what one particular band that, that springs to mind um, is Trivium that kind of, with the fact they put out a record kind of in that pandemic time and they, again, they just got back in the studio and rewritten it. When they were kind of able to then tour, they kind of done like a joint kind of package thing of saying, look, these are two fucking albums we've written that time. Let's just promote the, both the hell out of them on this record. So I, I guess when you guys do, when you guys get out to play and things, it is kind of a case of like, cool we've now got two like lots of material to draw from and obviously stuff you're already writing and things like that how does that kind of affect building a set list because as a fan like a set list going to a going to a gig right is one of the most important things because yeah you're seeing a band but you've all got your own personal favorite songs you want to hear and obviously in being in a band you've got songs you want to play how does a kind of kill the lights put together a set list because for me, it'd be a fucking nightmare. And I'm just a fan trying to put, put together another band set list. How, how do you guys find that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's hard. It's like picking singles off an album. Mm -hmm. You know, when when you love every song on the album, you're like, oh, I want this song or this song, but what about this song? Ah, mm -hmm. and then you're the like, well, I like this song. So you just, I think we, we find a middle ground in, okay, let's just, obviously the singles that we've released have got to be in there because we push yeah. them. Um, and then like just album tracks that we all agree on and all love really if it was up to me on this tour coming up now I'd be like let's play the Sinner in full and F Melodies in full like like you know like you said Trivium did like that double yeah. tour I'd play them both because we've never had a chance to tour the Sinner and we've yeah. never played Death Melody, so I, but obviously, yeah. um, you know the the other band that's just popped into my head as well is Biffy Clyro done that when they released uh, Celebration of Endings. They the first night of their tour, they just played that whole album in full, which they got a little bit of stick from certain fans because they're like, oh, I want to hear the classics, but I think that's bold as fuck just to be like, here's our new album in full, front to back, let's go. Like it, that's just bold as hell. I love that. You know? Yeah, I mean, when back in the day when we, I opened for Maiden in um, 2006. Mm. North America and they played their new album I made now yeah. you know the classic I made and played yeah. the new album from start to finish yeah and, that's mad uh, isn't it it's, it's, I the, like, that's, that's balls right there yeah I was about to say the brass balls on it fucking hell is good isn't it <laughs> I love that 
Um, so as, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning of the podcast, I've been lucky enough to speak to a lot of kind of your peers in terms of uh, from the South Wales scene and things like that. I kind of wanted to ask, what's your perception of growing up in, in South Wales? What was kind of like your kind of introduction into music and things? Because it's something I love to kind of drill down with when I get the opportunity with bands, because I like to see kind of where their trajectory kind of not falls off a cliff, but you fall in the deep end, if you like. So you all kind of start, for me personally, I started off with um, sort of Green Day, uh, Blink-182, Enter Shikari, Bullet for Valentine, and then it fucking fell off a cliff, mate. To be honest, then I was straight in the deep end. How does it kind of begin for you? Um, I was just lucky enough to have a group of friends um, that were into like metal, and but really, I found them because I I found Nirvana. It was Nirvana was my like Nirvana, amazing, nice. Thank you. Yeah. And then once I was into Nirvana, I was like, oh, you like Nirvana, and there was like this little pool of friends which like Nirvana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. From Nirvana, I just dropped off immediately. I was just like, I right, really straight in. everything to me. I was just like, I want it all. Um, yeah, I went like into the hardcore scene. I went into the punk, early 70s punk scene. I, I went everywhere and I was loving every. I was like, it's just like a sponge. You know, I just mm -hmm. wanted everything as long as it was fast, aggressive. Um, yeah, you know, as long as it wasn't pop music, really. Mm -hmm. It was all about it. So the faster, anything, or the more aggressive, or I don't know. I just if it was just not if it if it pissed people off, I was into it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um. So I, I wanted to kind of because again, you've got such a wealth of kind of knowledge and experience from being in, in various bands for over the years and things. I wanted to kind of ask. So being in a band for in, in bands for twenty plus years in the industry for, the, for that long. What kind of advice would you give to bands who not necessarily are, are young and up and coming, but just who are trying to break out into the industry, people who aren't in bands trying to get into, into this industry? What is the kind of key and success to longevity? Because I think that's a really important thing because being successful is one thing, but being successful and having longevity with that success. And obviously you've had it with, with multiple bands at this point kind of how do you kind of is there any kind of key is there any kind of cheat code how how would you kind of define that um it just depends on the person really myself i do it for the passion i don't yeah, do it sure. you know i just do it because i love doing it i loved it before i even played an instrument mm -hmm. when I, I was lucky enough to be able to play an instrument i just fell in love with it even more so if you believe in what you're doing just keep doing it you know don't let anyone tell you otherwise because we but back in the day, we used to have record labels turning us down all the time, saying, oh, you're never going to get played on a radio. And we were like, well, fuck you. We don't want to get played on the radio anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. Um, and secondly, don't do it for money. No, of course. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, because as soon as money gets involved, it's game over. Yeah. It, it just changes people. And I've seen it firsthand. And just, so just do it, for, do it for the love of doing it. You know, obviously, you know, don't, <laughs> don't make yourself homeless. You, no, you have, of course. You have to get paid, but don't get greedy. Just do it because you love it. And then I just think if you keep on that track, it just naturally happens for you, you know? Absolutely. And you know what? It, I, I, it's something that doing this podcast, which again is is not like being in a band, but I think it's the only thing I can kind of draw a parallel and comparison point is the one thing people always ask me who kind of when I said, I do a podcast, they're like, how much money do you make? And how many listeners, how many subscribers, whatever, blah, 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 you get, right? And I tell them none of that fucking matters because I, and I'm going to tell you this, right? Because I've won this game, right? So I started doing this podcasting content, whatever, 2016. Since then, I have managed to chat to every single person who has been in the music industry, who I personally respect, look up to, have admired their music and you're part of that collective now as well. I can now tick you off the list and say that's someone who, you know, I've really admired the work over the years. And I met my wife to be, we're getting married in July, like through me doing this. So it's kind of like if someone ever taps me on the shoulder and goes, what are you doing here? Well, you can't be doing this. I'm like, it's cool. I've won. I've like, I've completed not the hell a mission, but do you know what I mean? It's kind of like I've reached that glass ceiling, smashed through it and gone, I'm just going to carry on doing until I'm told I'm not allowed to. So my, my question kind of there is, have you ever had a case of kind of 
imposter syndrome is that something you've ever had in the past where you've kind of you've been in a situation um whether you're i don't know backstage at a festival or you're in like a, a record sort of meeting or anything like that, and you're going what what are we what, how am i here like do you know what i mean do you ever have that or is it just a case of you just are you know moose the confident drummer the confident man that we see uh, and things um i've had both mm. so um one i don't like being told what to do Nice. So yeah, yeah. You know, says you shouldn't be here, but like, well, fuck you, I'm going to prove you wrong anyway. Um, <laughs> I think that's a like, Walsh mentality. <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely. I just think, you know, if you want to do something, you shouldn't let other people decide if you, you should or shouldn't do it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then it was a time in a, a couple of years back, I just wasn't confident at all. And I was like, am I doing the right thing? Um, I, well, I was like going to shows and people were saying, oh, hi, most and stuff. I just didn't want to be there. I just felt like I shouldn't be there. I've like kind of had my time, but I was like, I've come back full circle now. And it's just, no, I'm just going to, I will, this is what I do. This, this is what I've done for 20 years, you know, before Bullet, I was a drummer mm -hmm. and a guitar player anyway. So I've enjoyed, I enjoy music and I'll, I'll keep on doing it. I don't care what anyone thinks, you know. I love that. I love that. So I wanted to kind of ask from from Kill the Lights perspective as a unit, as a band, but also from you personally, how does the creative process work in terms of creating the songs? Because some and again, I, I'm kind of I think about it in the sense of like what I felt like music was when I was 14. Right. So in my head, I'm like all bands get into a room together. They smash the fucking shit out of their instruments. And it happens a lot of the time. Again, doing this podcast, kind of revealing the magic. A lot of the time it's internet based and whatever you guys are geographically kind of apart because a couple of you guys are in America and some of you in England, I believe, and things like that. How does that kind of creative process work for you guys as a band and obviously for you personally? We love it when we're in a room together. You know, mm. it doesn't mean playing our instruments together, just being together and just relaxing, taking a piss out of each other. And then all of a sudden, when you're in that, just our comfort zone, like hanging out, Jordan or Travis will pick up a guitar and, then, and I'm like, what's that? And then yeah. James, James will pick up, what's, what are you playing there? And then mm. just that's how it goes. And then we start pulling the drums down and stuff. And obviously... Pandemic, no one could go anywhere, so it was definitely a lot of file sharing and stuff like that, right in, which was cool, but it wasn't like the vibe wasn't there. It was just like there's no one to kind of, you know, is this okay? You know, because when you're on your own, you're kind of in your own box, and everyone's uh, you're uh, everyone's their own worst cr critic. So everyone's, yeah, I know, so. you know what I mean? So I was just like, oh, this is shit. But once you turn into the boys, you're like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. So yeah, we we definitely when the pandemic. When Canada opened first, its borders mm -hmm. to vaccinated Americans and US, uh, UK people. We just went to Canada for just under two weeks and wrote eighty percent of the album. Amazing, nice, and I think that's the thing as well. I think if so, the expression goes, and it's true. A pressure, um, coal make. If you put coal under pressure, it makes diamonds, right? Yeah. And I feel like the same happens with people some of the time. If you put people in a pressure situation and gone right, you've got a week to write a fucking record you're more than likely, as talented musicians and a group of friends, you're going to come up with something. Do you know what I mean? And that's the thing. If you put pressure on people to like, okay, if you give people all the time in the world, they're less likely, in my opinion at least, to go and do that thing because they've got other distractions and whatever else. So it's kind of cool that, you, like you say, the pandemic kind of forced your hand to say, right, we've got this window of time where we can go and do this thing. Let's go and do this thing. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean... I think you are right. I had a question the other day, how do you know when a song's finished? I'm like, I think it's finished when you know it's finished because if it's, if you, if it's, it's like making a cake, if it sits around too long, you're going to keep prodding in and you're going to fucking ruin yeah. your cake. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So say everyone's happy, every, yeah, cool, poof, put it away and, and, and move on to the next one. Otherwise it gets stale and then you're like, oh, maybe I'll do it. You just get, you're just going to mess up your shit. So just... Uh I had that so much when I done a video, when I was done like YouTube content, things like that. I would record, I don't know, like an hour's worth. And then you start chopping it and you get to 30 minutes. You keep chopping it. You're down to 20 minutes. Keep chopping. And by the end of it, you've got like five minutes of fucking whatever. And it's like, well, some of that stuff was good. And you've just thrown it out because you're being too critical and you'll keep touching, you keep prodding, you keep poking it and you're left with not very much. So yeah, once it's, once it's done, put it there, leave it, don't touch it. It's done. Like, so that's really cool. I love that. I wanted to ask because 
I feel like you as an artist and as a drummer and things have inspired a lot of people uh, to pick up sticks and things like that and to get into music. Who inspires you in 2024? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be music either, just in general, in life. Who, who inspires you? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know where my inspiration comes from, to be honest. For sure. That's fair. That's a valid answer as well. I don't know. I just do it. It's like I kind of have to do it. Yeah. Because it's all I know to do, it's really. Um, I don't know, but I had, as as a, like a, a new drummer, it was, um, I really like this band called um, Lorna Shaw. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's my, it's my partner's favorite band. They're, right. they're, a little, they're a little bit too intense for me. I like them, don't get me wrong, but they're, I have to be in the right kind of headspace because <laughs> they're very I, intense. <laughs> when I first shoot them, I was like, that's not real drums. That's computer. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, 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 for sure. And then, I, and then I saw this guy called Austin playing, you know, playing his, mm -hmm. playing it, and I was like, "Fuck, someone could actually play like that." And then I, I commented on his Instagram yesterday, or when, mm -hmm. when it was when it was yesterday for me. Yeah, yeah. And he, he messaged me back saying, "Moose, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your drumming on the poison." And I was like, "Fuck, that's awesome!" Amazing. <laughs> I love that. I oh, like, that's, so, so, that's so cool. I love that. He's taken from like my one of my idols is Dave Lombardo, probably mm -hmm. the biggest heavy metal drummer in existence. So what Dave Lombardo did for heavy metal, I think this Austin guy is taking it a step further now, and he's like the next batch of metal drummer. You know, absolutely love that. I love that, and it kind of it kind of leads me quite nicely into a question I was going to ask is do you listen to kind of metal and things because when you're in a in your in your inner metal band i guess it could kind of somewhat some people would think be counterproductive to listen to kind of metal and i use this i used this metaphor and joke before of you kind of you walk into the into the studio walk into your practice from wherever and then the guy's like oh i found this sick riff and you just start playing an acdc song because you've heard that riff and oh, this is fucking sick but if you listen to metal you kind of like it seeps into your psyche and whatever else do you listen to kind of that stuff? I, I take it then in your fr in your spare time in your free time. I listen to everything. Like mm. one of my favorite bands is Blink One Eight Two. Amazing, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. I, I went to watch him in the O Two last year. That's Amazing, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I yeah, I love Lorna Shaw. I love stuff that's not forced down my throat. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's why I can never listen to the radio because it's just the same drivel on there all all of the time, which is talentless stuff in my eyes, anyway. Mm. Um, I really like the band Bad Omens at the moment. I think they're really yeah, yeah. good. You know uh, what? So I saw Bad Omens on this last Bring Me the Horizon tour, and I didn't, and I get, maybe I'm getting old, I don't know. I didn't quite understand it. I can clearly see there's a lot of talent there. and the, I heard, saw it live, and I was like, oh, I get it. It's like sexy metal. Like, and I felt like such a fucking idiot because I was like, I was like, why is he singing like that? It's kind of cool, but kind of weird. I don't, and I'm like, oh, oh, I get it because all these fucking people are going mad for it. Obviously, I am the idiot for not seeing. And my partner was just like, yeah, obviously. What, what the fuck? <laughs> so yeah, I, I love saw it. Him on that. I, I saw him on that same time. I, I didn't, I didn't get it. But now you're saying it. Okay, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's like, oh, I get it. I get it. He's obviously like this icon and the, yeah, I get it. Fair enough. Cool. I get it. It, it makes perfect sense. Um, you guys, uh, Kill the Lights, are heading out on a, a tour and things over the UK and Europe in April and May. How do you feel about playing these new songs live? I guess it kind of is, is a counterintuitive question because what we just sort of talked about is the fact that you kind of haven't been able to go and do that much anyway in terms of the new stuff. So it's all kind of new for you guys. Is there any kind of songs that you're particularly kind of looking at the set list? Again, if you don't want to tell me the actual names of the song, but like you're going, oh, that's going to be that's going to be tasty to play that one live. Ah, yeah, all of them. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're going to be opening with the, the first song of uh, Death Metal this year, you Scream. Yeah, which is a, a fucking rager. You know, a face melder, you know. It's, mm -hmm. You know, it's good to have Jay back. It opens with uh, a lot of Jay vocals in there. Yeah. Um, that one, um, the first song of The Sinner, Shed My Skin. There's, I don't know, it's just... The good thing about the band is it kind of goes in waves. We can do the super heavy thing and then we can chill mm -hmm. out a little bit. Yeah, but I don't think there's going to be much... Of the chill side, it's all going to be like a full on blown nice. assault because it's the nice. first where we're just going to tear people a new bum hole, I think. 
<laughs> I love that. And you know what? It's always nice to, to and I'll just say this. I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. You've got a very big smile on your face. You can tell that you're happy talking about the music and doing this stuff again, because like I say, 20 years in the music industry, 20 years plus in the music industry, I feel like some people it can it can chew up and spit back out. But you seem like you're in a in a good place, man. Is is that the case? Are you kind of happy and upbeat about things at the moment? Yeah, now I am. Mm. <laughs> then when the pandemic so that was the worst. And yeah, then absolutely. I was waiting in line and I was like, oh, come on. And, and everyone's like, you know, yeah, but now I got this coming up and this coming up and this is coming up. You know, it's, it's good. It's nice to be back, you know, and appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, so this is a question I like to ask my artists and my guests when I get the opportunity is, so essentially your agent phones you tomorrow, your book agent, whoever phones you tomorrow and go, Moose, you're heading out on tour tomorrow with the boys. What's the one thing you're double, double checking that you've put in your overnight bag before you leave for tour? My passport. Ah, see, everyone says that. And you know what? I think about that question. I'm like, obviously the passport, but is there, is there anything else apart from the passport that you're thinking like, just double, like basically something that you, you kind of, if you, the bus leaves and you're like, oh fuck, I've forgotten this one thing. Something that might help you through tour or kind of something that just, you can't kind of live without whilst on tour. Yes. The iPhone. Nice. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's like all it is. A model I mean, one iPod. <laughs> all of my warm up things are on here. Oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, nice. Old school. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So, so if I lose this, I'll still I'll be able to warm up. Yeah. But not as confidently as my little routine is on here. So it would be my little my little iPod with my little uh, warm ups on there. I love that. What so Again, this is a question that I've kind of added, right? And I've asked a few artists. But again, I think my 14-year-old self reading Krang magazine and whatever else has kind of put this in subconsciously now I'm 31, right? So I think back in the 80s, 90s, there was a lot of kind of debauchery going on behind behind the stage door and things like that. What is going on in 2024 for you personally, for the band ahead of stage? Because 30 minutes a lot of a lot of bands say to me they kind of they go in they go to the separate kind of areas of the room they go into a zen space and they come together how does it work for you as an artist and as the band as a whole do you kind of come together do you psych each other up how does that all kind of work well i've done i've done the debauchery (laughs) (laughs) my man (laughs) didn't stop in the 80s and 90s i carried on to the early 2000s as well i can tell you (laughs) um yeah but now i just um I'll warm up the boy, the guys will warm up and then you know that's it. Yeah, I love it. You just you just get the head the heads on, it's like cool, let's go tear these guys a new bum hole, as you put it earlier so eloquently. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's it. As soon as everyone's ready to rock and roll, that's it. I love that. I love that. Um, so I've got a couple of final questions for you, Moose, and I'm so so grateful for your time. As I say, it's a it's a huge privilege to sit down and chat with yourself because as I say I've been a fan of your music for a very very long time. Um, so a question I like to ask. I was going to bin it out. I was going to bin it off in 2024. I asked every single guest in 2023 this question, but my partner was like, "No, keep it in." It's yeah, you're going to still got some good answers. I'm hoping, I'm banking on you to give me a good answer, right? So. When Spotify or Apple or Amazon or insert big corporate brand buys my podcast from me, right? What I'm going to do is rather than uh, reinvest the money back in the podcast, I'm going to blow it all on one big festival, right? And Kill the Lights are invited to play the festival along with all the other bands who've appeared on the show. It's going to be about a week long. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be a lovely eclectic bill of all different bands. We're having it in the biggest field we can physically get our hands on. Now, what I'd like to know, Moose, is what you would like to add to the dream rider of the festival. Now, there's a couple of caveat points, right? There is no financial restriction. There is no, like, logistical restriction. You can have literally whatever you want. So I'll give you a couple of examples of what people have said in the past. We had Josh from Cattle Decapitation say to me, I want a laundry service, which I thought was a touch of fucking genius because he is going to be everyone's best friend. Mm -hmm. You know, who doesn't want clean clothes? Um, Andy from therapy said to me, I just want clean socks, clean underwear. I was like, yep, fine. Easy, like whatever. Matt from August Burns Red, a fellow drummer said to me, I want, (laughs) this is so fucking American as well. Bless him. Um, A full scale 
like monster truck rally set up at the festival, <laughs> like sponsored by Monster Energy Drink or something. Like you can be more American if you tried. Um, we've had people say to me, I had a Norwegian band on and say they want a specific brand of Norwegian energy drink. What would you like to add? You can have whatever you would like. Oh, do you know, you put me on the spot now because <laughs> I'm not a man of, you know, I don't buy anything for myself. I don't, I don't like it. Well, the uh, thing is, you, you can have it for yourself or you can have it for the good of everybody else. Because like I say, Josh from Cattle to Cap was like, I want a storage service that everyone can use, which I think is, again, a, a real cool thing. Um, I had um, the uh, the Mario from uh, the Blackout Problem say to me that he, this was, I think, to be fair, he's probably won the game. He said, I want to give everyone a free ticket who financially can't afford one. And I was like... You've, you've won the game, my friend. But I'm still going to play the game, but you've pretty much won the game. Is there anything you'd like to add, either like yourself, for, you, for yourself or on behalf of the festival? There you go. An open bar for every punter. An open bar. Oh, yeah, see, that's it. Smashed it. Smashed it out of the park. Okay. Um, Moose, I've got one final question. It is a question I've asked every single artist in the last four years who's been gracious enough to give me their time on this podcast. It's a question that is personal to you, and it is what is the best thing about being in a band for you? I said to my wife today, um, is I never did it for the money. Mm. Now I'm getting only now, twenty years late, I'm getting like a lot of notoriety for what I've did, and I'm, uh, introduced a lot of people to drumming, and th those people now becoming, you know, big drummers themselves. So if I've played a little part in you know anyone following their dreams that's that's it for me i love that i love that um kill the lights new album death melody the death melodies even will be out uh everywhere now as people hear this podcast is there anything you want to say to the people listening and watching at home mate um just go get it listen to it stream it buy it do whatever you like um and come out to the shows and have fun lovely job thank you so much mate this has been a genuine pleasure and an honor because like i say um your your music uh, throughout bullet's career throughout this fucking band all of it is just top notch and yeah you helped shape my musical journey over the, your drumming tracks over the years so thank you mate this has been a fucking legendary opportunity thank you cool man thank you very much for having me see you in a bit awesome speak soon everybody